Amos. We have been uh, walking our way through the minor prophets, not in the order that they appear, but in, in the order that they were given. So we're looking at them chronologically. And so we started with the book of Joel, which is the oldest of the minor prophets. And now we're in the book of Amos. Next we go to the book of Jonah, which will be a very interesting book. But to finish out chapter 5 this evening, very interesting passage about the day of the Lord. So let's look at it together. We'll read there in starting at verse 16 where we finished last week of chapter 5. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas. And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Now will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy viols. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Shuan in your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So the day of the Lord is darkness. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. It has so much to teach us, and may we learn tonight. And Lord, may you guide us in your truth and speak to every heart through the power of your precious word. We lift you up and your word up, and may our service lift, lift up Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We've seen this many times when we preach through the book of Isaiah and a little bit in Jeremiah, but God here is himself describing the day of the Lord. Now, we, we saw as we studied through Isaiah, the day of the Lord is not referring to a physical 24-hour day. It's referring to a period of time. It's primarily referring to what we refer to as the tribulation period, as Jesus describes it in Matthew 24, the seven-year time of God's wrath being poured out upon this earth. We saw that it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. We see that it's Daniel's, <coughs> Daniel's 70th week, but it is time of judgment, time where God pours out his judgment, his final time of judgment on the nation of Israel, his chosen people, just prior to then giving them the kingdom. And um, <clears throat> as he says there in verse 18, woe unto you that desire it. The last thing we should desire is this day, this day of the Lord, because it is a time that many will die. Now, if you, if you look at the book of Revelation and look at it as God wrote it, which is chronologically, it's very easy to see the breakdown. You've got the first three chapters primarily written to the church, which is us. Then the church disappears. Chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither, you never hear from them again, except to see the 24 elders around the throne with robes of righteousness and crowns on their heads. Then starting in chapter 6, all the way through chapter 18, is this period of time called the day of the Lord. And it is a time of judgment. And during that time, more than two-thirds of the earth will die. Imagine that. So let's say it happened tomorrow. God took his, the church tomorrow. Two-thirds of eight billion people will die in seven years. That'll make COVID look like nothing. And that, it's going to be a terrible time. And as we saw in, in Isaiah, God describes it over and over. But he describes it in the Old Testament. He describes it in the New Testament. And it's always a time of judgment. So let's look at some New Testament verses, 1 Thessalonians 5. Just make sure we get a handle on what it is first. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. And then we'll look some, at some more of the descriptions of this day. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2. 
Notice what the Bible says. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, as we understand it from Revelation 19, happens after this terrible seven-year period. But the day of the Lord begins as a surprise to the world. It begins as a thief in the night. Now I'll go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and we'll see it again. The Bible says, but the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, 10, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So God says, woe unto you that desire this day. Because as we'll see, this day is a terrible day. And God says to Israel there in verse 18 of our passage, to what end is it for you? What will be the end for you? Well, if you go to Zechariah 13, which we'll get to Zechariah eventually as we walk through these books. But God even explains that sure, sure enough, it ties in with Revelation Two-thirds of the earth will die, and two-thirds of the Jews will die during this time. Notice Zechariah 13, 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So there God is very clear in Zechariah 13, 8, that two-thirds will die. Now go to Matthew 24, where Jesus is giving us a summary, if you will, of the end times. Just prior to going to Calvary, the disciples asked him the question about the end, and Jesus then summarized it for them. Notice verse 21 of Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation. Now you know why we call it the tribulation period. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. So there's no question that the tribulation will be worse than it's ever been on the earth. Why? Because Jesus said so. Amen? Nor ever shall be. So there will never be a time this, this horrible as well. Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. So if, if, it, if it lasted more than seven years, God says everyone would die. It's that terrible of a time. So Revelation 6, 8. Turn there. And look what God says. <clears throat> With just one plague, Revelation 6, 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. So in one plague, the pale horse plague, one-fourth of mankind will die. That's just one plague. Then over, or look down at verse 17 of the same chapter, for the... The great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now go to chapter 9 of Revelation. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. These are just two of the plagues in Revelation. One kills a fourth of the earth. And they're doing a lot of fractions with the homeschooling the grandkids at home. So if there's one, three fourths left now after the first plague, and it says one third of that three fourths dies, that's another fourth of the original. Got that? Okay, this is not a math class. It's okay if you don't get it. But um, one third of three fourths is one fourth. <laughs> So one-fourth dies, then another fourth of the original dies. What's that leave? Half. So one-half of the original population of mankind dies just in the two plagues. Now, that's not all that die, but that's just two plagues that kills one-half of mankind. So it looks like overall, two-thirds of mankind will die in the tribulation period. So why? that's why God says, to, one, to what end is it for you? Why would you desire such a day? Because this day, go back to our passage, Amos chapter 5, verse 18. God himself is describing his 
day of the Lord, it's the day of judgment. Look what he says. The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. This is God describing it. Not man. God is saying that the day of the Lord is darkness. Let's look at some other verses that go along with this. Look at Isaiah 13, 9. And I just, so we understand now that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, that the day of the Lord, two-thirds at least of mankind will perish in just this, that seven-year period. But just to get some descriptive words from the Lord about the day, look at Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So here he calls it a day of wrath. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. And this will help us understand dispensationally whose period of time this is. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. Alas, for that great, great day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Yes, one third of the Jews will survive and inherit the kingdom. But it's not a day of the church's trouble, is it? It's the day of Jacob's trouble. Then while you're in Jeremiah, look at chapter 46, verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be and made drunk with their blood. Remember when we went through the book of Joel, God said it's a time of destruction from the Almighty. He's called it also in uh, Joel chapter 2 a terrible time. So this is the day of the Lord. This is a day of darkness. God himself refers to this day, this time of Jacob's trouble, as a time of darkness on the earth. Jesus himself said there would have never been a time this horrible and there never will be. Of course, two-thirds of the earth dying in seven years. Imagine that. So back to our passage this evening. Verse 20. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. This is God himself describing the day of the Lord. Verse 22. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Verse 23, take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear. It's all about judgment. God has chosen to discipline his children, his chosen people, Israel, because of their disobedience to his commands to not worship other gods primarily. And it culminates in this day of the Lord. Verse 24, let judgment run down. It's all about judgment. Judgment upon sin. So, what does that mean for you and me? I'm glad you asked that question. Judgment can only be executed by the judge, amen? And God is the judge. And you and I, if you go to John chapter 5, we owe a judgment... And that judgment is to perish in hell. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, Revelation 20, 14. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our judgment, the judgment that we owe, is to go to hell for our sin. Praise God when Jesus Christ died on the cross and said, it is finished. He paid for that. Hallelujah. Look at John 5, 24. Very, very, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. The day you were saved, you were rescued from the condemnation that you deserved, that we deserve from, from our sin. We were rescued from that. Shall not come into condemnation. Once you're born again, you can never again be condemned for sin. Imagine that. Like we talked this morning, the justification that we have through Jesus Christ. 
Because as we know, the Bible says he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So judgment for Christians has been settled. Amen? When Jesus died on that cross and paid that price, the judgment was done. And that was the judgment for our sin. So the judgment we're talking about tonight <clears throat> from the coming day of the Lord is not the judgment for your and yours and mine sin. This is a judgment upon Israel for their sins in disobeying God's command. <clears throat> God chose to create Israel, didn't he? He said, I'm gonna I'm gonna randomly choose, or I shouldn't say randomly, but I'm gonna choose a man named Abraham, and I'm gonna create a nation from him. That nation will last forever. They will be my special nation, and my goal is that they will be a testimony to the nations around them of what happens when God blesses a nation, which happened at the beginning. They reached their culmination under Solomon, and then downhill from there, and they started disobeying God's commands. And it's been that way now for close to 3,000 years. Imagine that. Close to 3,000 years. So now that we know that it is judgment, and it is darkness, and it is wrath, and it is anger, God pouring all that out upon Israel, and it spills out onto the whole earth, <clears throat> what does that mean for you and me? Well, if you go to Ephesians 4.30, the Bible teaches that you and I have been made part of something else. Amen? Amen? The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Now, we don't have time to go through all of it, but the day you were saved, you were made part of a new thing called the body of Christ. Amen? 1 Corinthians 12.13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. It started from the day of Pentecost, and it's still going now. We are made part of a new thing called the body of Christ or the church. Jesus' body. Did, did we read anything about Jesus' body when it goes through the tribulation? No. Why? Because we won't be here. Go to 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and we'll understand why. Now will there be wickedness and wrath and sin on the earth? Of course. We see it all around us. We're in the latter days. We're in the end times. No question about it. The time is here. But 1 Thessalonians 1.10, look there. Paul, who here's writing to the church, and look what he says. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the what? The wrath to come. The most common word that God used to describe the tribulation period is wrath. But you can't confuse this wrath with hell. Okay? Hell is judgment for our sin. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about God pouring out his wrath upon the earth, which he has yet to do in the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Daniel's 70th week. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then one more, Revelation 3.10. God here, who's he writing to? The churches, right? Chapter 2, chapter 3, the letters to the seven churches. So he's writing to us. What does he say? Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He says to the church, I'm going to keep you from this hour. And he sometimes refers to this period as an hour as well. But what's it say? It will come upon the whole world and it will be upon everyone that dwells upon the earth. Well, there's never been something like that. A time when God pours out his wrath upon the whole earth. But there will be. And so... 
This dispensation that's coming is Jewish. It's God's wrath upon the Jews. It's God's wrath upon Jacob. Right? Jacob's trouble. It's the time where God's wrath is poured out upon Jacob or Israel. Do other people die as well? Yes. But its main purpose is to finish the chastisement of Israel. And he's been prophesying of it all through the Old Testament, hasn't he? Like how many times we read about it in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and now we'll be reading about it over and over with all through Joel. We read about it all through the minor prophets that this day is coming. So this time of Jacob's trouble, can, how can we mix that with the body of Jesus Christ? They're two separate things, aren't they? So what God's going to do is going to he's going to end that period of time, which is parenthetical, by the way. We know that the church isn't in the Old Testament, because Paul says so. He said it was a mystery, the body of Christ. He told us multiple times it was a mystery, Romans 16 and other places in Ephesians. So God created this mystery dispensation that started at Pentecost. It will end on this, at the same point that the Daniel's 70th week or Jacob's trouble begins. They will it will simultaneously end one time and begin another. It will end the time of the body of Christ. As a body, it will, we will be gone, and it will begin a time of a Jewish dispensation of God punishing his people for their disobedience, his people, the Jews. And um, to mix them just doesn't make any sense. Plus, we have the book of Revelation in our hands. Amen? You could essentially call it a manual for how to survive the tribulation period. Don't, put, don't take Mark the Beast. It starts there. Because if you do, you've just condemned your soul. And your only choice is to basically flee to the, flee to the mountains, Jesus says. Because it will be illegal to not take the Mark of the Beast. You can't buy or sell without the Mark of the Beast. But if you take the Mark of the Beast, you're going to go to hell. So what do you do? You run. And a lot of people are going to get their heads cut off are not taking the mark. We read about all this in Revelation. So it's all laid out for us. If, if we're going to be there, which we won't, uh, God's given a manual for it for those who find themselves in it. But what are we told to watch for? Are we told to watch for the Antichrist? Are we told to watch for the mark of the beast? Or are we told to watch for Jesus? We're told to watch for Jesus, Amen. And we're told that it's going to come as a thief in the night. We're told that it's going to be, it can happen at any moment, that it's always been imminent. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul believed with all of his heart that Jesus was going to come back before he died. All the disciples did. They thought, okay, Jesus just went to heaven. We're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel, which they did, by the way. Look in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2, where it says the whole world has heard the gospel. They figured, okay, we did it, Lord. We told the whole world about Jesus. He's coming soon. And they were right to believe so. Amen? Because we've always been told, the church, that is, to expect Jesus. If we are going into the tribulation period, then all of those imminent expectations of Jesus get pushed out to his second coming to the earth, which we know happens in Revelation 19. Well, there's plenty of signs to know basically the day that that will happen. You'll be, the, the day that Satan goes and sits in the temple in Jerusalem and the whole world worships him as God, from that day we know three and a half years later Jesus is coming to the earth on a white horse with saints with him. So we'll be able to, if we have to go through the tribulation, we'll be able to say, yeah, okay, Jesus is coming on this day. Where'd the eminency go? There, there wouldn't be any. But if Jesus is coming to take us out of here, which he tells us he will in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that explains why one dispensation ends and another one begins. The church dispensation ends the same day that the Jewish dispensation of tribulation begins. It, it all fits like a perfect puzzle. So don't let people try to tell you that you are going to go into the tribulation because if you are, then all of these admonitions to look for Jesus, 
they want true. We're to be watching for him, amen? We're to be expecting Jesus at any moment. He said, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. So that's what we're to be watching for. Don't let people trick you into saying, oh, no, we're, watching, we're looking for the Antichrist. Well, may, maybe he's alive. I don't know. Maybe Jesus is coming tomorrow to take us away. Praise God. And yeah, my God set things up beforehand so that hey, the church, the world can go right into it. Yes, of course. But that's not what we're to be watching for. Don't be watching for earthquakes. Don't be watching for famines. Don't be watching for the mark of the beast. Watch for Jesus. Amen? Because this day, the day of the Lord, which begins with the rapture and ends with our wonderful Savior coming back on a white horse with a two-edged sword to judge the nations, with us with him, by the way. That day is a day of darkness. So, little dispensation lesson there mixed in. Praise God. Praise God for your salvation. Praise God that you've been delivered from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for all you've done for us through Jesus. Thank you for our salvation.